And that, you know, we're just kind of at the, that point that I would argue is kind of a wily Coyote moment where those long and variable lags are likely just about to hit. But just like, you know, the boy who cried wolf, everyone's so sick of hearing it and they're watching financial markets go up. They're like, well, maybe it's never going to happen, right? It's going to happen. We're going to see the recession. <clears throat> we're going to see the negative ramifications of much higher interest rates, particularly on corporate America. We're going to see it hit the young who have in the United States financed much of their lifestyle with credit card debt that they're now beginning to default on. They're the ones that came into this event without automobiles, for example. And so they're the ones that are being adversely affected by having bought and financed automobiles at very high prices. It's This is a real challenge. On this episode of the the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on Michael Green, who's Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. So Michael, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Anthony, thank you for having me. No problem. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So it's it's definitely been a very interesting year, I think, from many perspectives. So I guess in your opinion, what is your current assessment maybe of what we've seen throughout the year, uh, maybe both on a global economy standpoint and also from financial markets? Well, I mean, this has obviously been a very surprisingly strong year for the stock market. It's been, I think, a challenging year for the bond market for a variety of reasons, primarily because the Federal Reserve has continued to hike interest rates and indicate a you know, higher for longer path. Even as we've seen a tremendous advance or recovery from the high inflation prints that we saw last year and really that kind of peaked X, the Russia impact on energy markets, you know, back in December of 2021 is where we really saw the highest month over month levels in terms of kind of the core components of inflation. Um, so I think a lot of people, myself included, have been surprised at the Fed continuing to push particularly in the light of, you know, elements like bank failures, et cetera, that, you know, seem to have come and gone with very little impact. But if we look underneath the surface, we're continuing to see an extraordinary reduction in the amount of credit that is available and the amount of credit that is being demanded. Historically, that has been a driver of relatively deep and serious recessions. It, it The thing I think that many of us saw going into this that has actually borne fruit and played out is that if we were going to see much longer and slower, lead, you know, a long and variable lag would be longer than we would otherwise anticipated because people had locked in fixed sources of financing, mortgage rates in the United States in particular, not nearly as adjustable. We've been slow to see the impact in places like Canada or even the UK um, through a variety of reasons, right? Everything ranging from moratoriums to, you know, various forms of customer support that have been tried to push through. But in general, you're also seeing a lot of distress, right? I mean, you're in the UK and if you look at the lower middle class in the UK, they're really in a lot of pain, right? It's an unusual for a finance minister to have to announce that, hey, everyone's poor, right? Um, yeah, it's a very hard thing for people to uh, contemplate and deal with, particularly when that poverty seems to be largely a byproduct of the leadership choices that were made by the politicians in the first place, right? We didn't have to respond to COVID in the way that we did. We didn't have to behave in the manner that we behaved around many of our policies. Um, and as a result, I think there's a lot of frustration and anger that's boiling over that creates the risk that we're going to continue to have extreme moves on the populism side and then on the austerity side in response to it, right? Um, so all of this, I think, is is creating a really confusing mismatch in which other forces are then kind of able to dominate. And the biggest of those is just the very slow growth of labor forces and populations around the developed world that is creating a relative scarcity of employees um, we're not actually seeing very strong labor growth, right? We're not seeing strong employment growth. We're just seeing very weak to negative labor force growth that is depressing unemployment and, again, leading to very confusing information that we're receiving. And that, you know, we're just kind of at the, that point that I would argue is kind of a wily e. coyote moment where those long and variable lags are likely just about to hit. But just like, you know, the boy who cried wolf, Everyone's so sick of hearing it and they're watching financial markets go up. They're like, well, maybe it's never going to happen, right? It's going to happen. We're going to see the recession. <clears throat> We're going to see the negative ramifications 
of much higher interest rates, particularly on corporate America. We're going to see it hit the young who have in the United States financed much of their lifestyle with credit card debt that they're now beginning to default on. They're the ones that came into this event without automobiles, for example. And so they're the ones that are being adversely affected by having bought and financed automobiles at very high prices. It's This is a real challenge, right? And again, um, you know, a recession deferred doesn't actually necessarily mean that it becomes a better scenario. You kick the can down the road if you think a solution will present itself, you know, um, at some forward period. In regions of the world where we have slow and negative population growth, we're actually perversely increasing the burdens of higher debt levels, more retirees, et cetera, as we kick the can down the road. So the policy of the past just simply don't work, right? We need to do something different. Yeah, so many, so many great points there. So I guess if we focus on specifically said that at the Fed, we've everyone's been surprised by the actions they've taken. They've tightened a lot faster and a lot more than I guess lots of people expected. Do you think they're just so narrow in their view of what they're looking at? They've, you know, they've obviously focused on inflation a lot, but now they're really, it seems like they're looking at employment, which you mentioned there, that there's a re- some reasons why maybe it hasn't moved as much as they thought. So they're looking at the employment and they're saying, oh, this is all okay. We can keep tightening to make sure inflation gets under control. Do you think it's that? Or do you think there's maybe a, 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 another issue at play here? Well, so so one of the narratives that kind of exists out there is, is that the Federal Reserve is, you know, actively involved in trying to harm China, right? Or, you know, use the dollar as a strategic weapon by inflating the value of the dollar. I, I'm skeptical of that. Um, it's possible. And certainly if we were actively in a kinetic war, I would be shocked if we weren't using all aspects of that type of policy to prosecute that war. But there's just no evidence that that's actually the case. And if anything, you know, when I speak to politicians, um, I, I, I generally think that at this point, there's more just uncertainty and and they don't really actually know what they're trying to do. And so they kind of sidestep and say, well, you know, monetary policy is the province of the Fed, even when it severely negatively impacts the fiscal standing of the United States and forces our allies, by the way, to chase our currency by raising their interest rates as well. Um, you know, creating conditions that particularly in places like Europe, which is even structurally worse in terms of what appears to be the, the you know, natural rate of interest, they've just had to push way beyond those levels, right? And so we'll find out if there's important, conf- you know, consequences associated with what feels like overly aggressive monetary policy. Um, I think we had a good indication of what the Fed is thinking. If you look at the June speech from Christopher Waller, um, he highlighted the idea that because the Fed has been so forceful and so clear in its communications and so aggressive in its hiking, that we should see long and variable lags function with a shorter lead, that he actually believes that we've seen all of the implications. And I think he would largely point to the deterioration in asset markets that occurred primarily in 2022 as the indication of that. Um, his argument is like, you know, if you convey through the expectations channel just how serious you are, right? You know, if you as a parent yell at your kid loud enough, Right, they're bound to understand how serious you actually are and and uh, follow your expectations. Sounds like Christopher Waller might not have raised kids. Um, I know that's not actually true, but yelling at your kids louder doesn't actually do anything other than make them fear you and think you're crazy. Uh, it doesn't nat- actually lead to better long-term behaviors. If anything, it does the work the reverse. And I I think the indications are as I you know, said at the, at the intro to this, that actually the long and variable lags are going to be even longer and more variable because of the long period of low interest rates that we've now replaced with a period of much higher than uh, expected interest rates. And so we'll see what the consequences of that are, right? And now having locked itself into two consecutive mistakes, having been overly loose through the 2021 period, failing to take advantage of the acceleration in the economy and the excess fiscal stimulus that came through most Western economies and begin to withdraw accommodation and remove support, you know, reiterating as late as November of 2021, like, hey, we're we're not going to hike forever, basically, right? Um, You know, now, of course, they're embarrassed and they're behaving in the opposite direction, right? And I, I hate to constantly use the parenting analogies. I'm 
fortunately now an empty nester, so I don't have to worry about it nearly as much. But that really is the underlying kind of dynamic, right? I mean, you're now at a point where like mom has behaved totally irrationally. And rather than admitting she overreacted, she's just, you know, sticking to it, right? You know, want to stand firm to show that you're really, re you know, not reactionary, even as everybody in the family suffers. It's basically like, okay, just let mom cool off, right? Um, that's the dynamic that I think is going on. The Fed is just, you know, so intent on showing us how serious and powerful and credible they are that they're going to create, a, a, you know, what I think is going to actually be a disproportionate downward response as we suddenly discover that, you know, something like 30% of businesses in the United States are actually extraordinarily vulnerable to failure tied to much higher interest rates. Yeah, I, I guess if we I look know, at I want to correct myself there. Not thirty percent of the businesses; it's thirty percent of employment in the United States. Uh, not the not by number of businesses. I don't have that statistic. Okay, makes sense. And then if we look at that, like uh, as you said, a lot of the actions they've taken, you'd assume would have been negative for uh, the economy, and then maybe as well for companies' earnings, etc. And then from there for the markets. But we we probably haven't seen that as, as much yet. Do you think it's just the point that uh, these things are such? lagging indicators and it takes a while for you know as you mentioned that the credit changes and the, and the cost of capital to permeate throughout the economy that we just haven't seen it yet or why do you think maybe we you know markets have been so strong and we haven't seen uh the effects go through it yet well i think this is actually one of the great ironies is, is that we actually have seen evidence of the effects already if you look at the united states for example and you look at the level of home sales in particular existing home sales they've plummeted below the levels of the global financial crisis, right? This is the worst experience we ever had, despite the fact that our population and number of houses is something like 20% higher than it was at that point in time. Um, not quite that much. I think it's like 15. But so we're now actually below those previously unimaginably low levels. And, you know, we're saying, oh, everything seems fine, right? Well, what's actually being tracked and monitored are things like new home sales, new home home sales are being inflated by national home builders who have access to financing by, you know, effectively creating buy downs in interest rate mortgages or mortgages and, you know, lowering those interest rates by several percentage points for kind of a two year period so that people can continue to afford the new home. Right. The argument is very straightforward. Hey, you'll be able to refinance when the Fed cuts rates in two years. Well, the problem is, is, you know, in financial markets, when we talk about prices, markets where prices are at highs, but volume and trading activity is hitting lows, that's not a healthy condition, right? What that's actually just telling you is, is that there is an extraordinarily restricted level of supply that is playing through because nobody is yet willing to acknowledge what's changed in the underlying dynamic. And at the same time, we haven't yet encountered the distressed sales that would emerge with higher levels of job loss. And um, not necessarily, by the way, unemployment, but just job loss, right? If people need to change where their job is located, if they need to sell their home, if they need to do these things, you know, that's going to actually create distress. Ironically, things like the return to office, kind of forcing people to go back to that, um, could create a catalyst that makes people suddenly say in rural locations where they bought homes with, you know, the objective of video commuting or, or telecommuting you know, oh my gosh, I have to sell my home in Idaho so that I can, you know, keep my job in Silicon Valley, or I have to sell my home in Idaho so that I can, you know, do my financial services job in Chicago. Um, that runs the risk of creating supply of properties that is currently missing, right? And it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, again, going back to the, the the home builder component, if I look at the national home builders, the DR Hortons, the Lennars, et cetera, of the world, and I look at the share that they've taken because they have unique and privileged access to their internal financing arms, where they're able to buy down effectively these mortgage rates and reduce the payments for kind of a two year period. That's creating conditions under which people are now you know, buying those few related homes that's causing the perception that prices are stable and remaining high. Even if you were to try to push through just a little bit more supply, there's a very real probability that prices would collapse. So we'll, we'll see, but we don't actually know the answer yet. Yeah, it makes sense. And I guess, if you, as you said, if you look at the US, it's fixed rates. So there's, it's more going to be almost a standoff of people just trying to do whatever they can to stay, keep their current mortgages. Whereas I guess in the 
variable uh, countries such as Australia, UK, Canada, there's going to be more of that forceful push once you get have to refinance to higher rates that you might actually be forced to sell. You don't need that. Right. And, and so yeah. even in countries where you have variable rates, I mean, most people forget that those variable rates have kind of like five-year reset periods, right? So it doesn't hit all at once. It's some small fraction of the population that gets hit at any point in time. When you're in an environment in which they're looking at their home and saying, wait a second, you know, um, my mortgage just reset a lot higher. Um, I may have to sell my home, but, you know, I'm not sure if I try to sell my home that I'll get the price that I need to finance the purchase of another property or find another place to live. You know, that that becomes really problematic. Right. And so you have people holding on as long as they possibly can you know, basically trying to keep up with the Joneses in almost kind of a negative framework. Uh, um, and then we discover if we get a, a cultural clearing moment where it becomes okay to say, you know what, Sheriff of Nottingham can take my property. Um, and it, it, unfortunately, I think that's not a terrible analogy when I look at places like the UK, where it's, you know, let's get rid of 30-year mortgages and replace them with 100-year mortgages so that they become affordable. It's like, guys, like 100-year more, you know, intergenerational mortgages, let's just call that serfdom, right? Um, let's just be really clear. You're paying for the privilege of staying in place. Yeah, and you already have to lease land. So you're basically <laughs> leasing the land and, and the house as well, which will be- Sounds uh, wonderful, doesn't it? The, the Western <laughs> principles of liberty and freedom are, are very much in place. Yeah, they're, they're very strong. So uh, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, I guess, the property market. I guess if we, if we look at sort of stock market, if we look at the-, the uh, this year, I guess, yeah, it seems like all the risk on assets have really appreciated a lot. Ah, you look at the NVIDIAs and, you know, the, the other um, assets there. Um, what, what do you think has been driving that? Has that just been, uh, you know, the fact that the economy has been hold, uh, holding out more than expected? Is it maybe that people started to realize, ah, oh, crap, we're sort of positioned incorrectly. We're going to underperform the market. We have to go back in. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so... You know, again, this is an area in which I have very strong uh, views that I think are largely divergent, but I, I have to emphasize that it's always a combination of factors, right? So yes, the economy has been stronger than many people had anticipated. That has actually led to somewhat of a recovery. Um, we saw uh, shorts emboldened in 2022 and pushing names like, you know, Tesla and ARC and various other stuff much lower under a high degree of confidence that these were ultimately going to be zeros. Um, that's Those have been difficult trades to hold. And so they've created conditions where companies like Carvana, for example, has risen you know four or 500% despite having a structurally unprofitable business of selling automobiles into a struggling automobile market. Um, you know, they, 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 they almost become, you know, like um, almost perfect human comedy type aspects, right? Where, you know, somebody who has extraordinary talent like a Dan Loeb or a David Einhorn have basically sworn off shorting publicly traded stocks because they recognize that the market has become so thin and so um, unpredictable in terms of its ability to be swung by things like options or by short squeezes that the fundamentals are not something they can actually carry through to maturity, right? So again, you know, uh, not to pick on one in particular, and I actually do have a short position in this name now that I re very recently put on. But if you look at something like Carvana, you know, they rallied on the idea that they were restructuring their debt. Part of the restructuring of their debt requires them to issue a billion dollars worth of equity that was announced 20 days ago. They got 10 days left in which to, you know, issue a billion dollars of equity. That's not an easy game, right? Like that's, you know, you don't just like issue a billion dollars of equity easily, right? You have to find people who are actually willing to take the bet and buy that. Um, and so, you know, that it feels almost absurd in some ways. But exactly like Stan Druckenmiller being forced to cover at the peak of the dot-com bubble or... I would argue Dan Loeb swearing off shorting at exactly this point in time. Like there's all sorts of challenges that are created by what I think is actually the dominant feature in the market, which is passive investing. And so you're familiar with the work that I've done on that. Your audience is probably less familiar with it. But just to orient people, passive investing is any type of index investing. But in particular, it's the index investing that's tied to market capitalization or adjusted market capitalization indices. 
things like the S&P 500, the total market indices of the uh, uh, Center for the Research on Securities Prices, CRSP, it's more broadly known as the indices that Vanguard or others track. And th the problem is, is that we've gone from a market in which passive investing was kind of an interesting sideshow to a market in which passive investing has become the dominant force. All of the flows, actually more than 100% of the flows that now come into the market are tied to passive investment vehicles. The rules under which those passive investment vehicles operate create fairly predictable outcomes one of which is exactly what you're describing, right? The largest cap companies do best. Why? Because there's a mismatch between their market capitalization and the degree of liquidity that is available in the market. And so when I have somebody like Vanguard who owns you know, 7%, 8% of the US stock market coming in and trying to allocate to stocks on the basis of their market capitalization, if you're buying that proportional amount of Apple, you're going to the you know, largest stocks in the indices, you're going to overwhelm the market making capabilities and push the stock higher, um, regardless of the underlying fundamentals, right? And so we have this perverse dynamic where the most richly valued stocks are the largest stocks. Those that seem to express the greatest potential for future profit growth are those that have grown the most in the past, right? Um, it's kind of the ultimate irony of, of the disclaimer that you have to put out in uh, investing, which is past performance is no predictor of, you know, guarantee of future results. But when you enter into a model in which you allocate capital and the marginal flow of capital is being done on this way, in which you reward companies that have gone up in price by buying more of their shares as com and more putting more capital into them as compared to less because you see the prospects in the future being diminished by those price gains. It changes the character of the market and creates exactly these types of conditions that we're experiencing. Yeah, I, I guess then it pushes the people who are tracking, uh, you know, the uh, these indexes or even people who are trying to compete against it. They're going to have to sort of do more to try and even you know recreate those returns or, or try and pass them. If if you well, I mean, a, a really simple example would be something like an Apple or a Microsoft or even an Nvidia to a certain extent, right? So if I think about the definition of a diversified fund or how most people would approach investing, you know, you actually have legal restrictions on what fraction of your portfolio can be invested in the largest names in your portfolio. Well, the S&P 500 is actually now in violation of those restrictions, right? The NASDAQ 100, the Qs, was, was ridiculously in violation of those restrictions. Um, but those restrictions are waived for index vehicles because of policy choices that are being made. So you can actually imagine a scenario in which a discretionary manager that's trying to keep up, if they have the flexibility, will respond to that type of behavior by saying, you know what, I can't buy enough Apple to match my benchmark. Therefore, I'm going to buy call options on Apple to allow me to participate to the degree that Apple will rise in the market. And you know what, the benefit is, is that when I buy those call options on Apple, I'm not really exposed to all the downside that occurs, right? Well, when I go into the market and I buy call options on Apple, I then you know, have to drive the market maker to hedge their exposure as well. So they become a significant buyer of Apple, pushing Apple prices higher, pushing my call options further into the money, raising the delta hedge ratio, the amount of shares that the market makers then have to buy. And so you create these feedback loops that again, give rise to these somewhat predictable behaviors um, and so when the economy stays stronger and people remain employed and interest rates paradoxically rise to the point that people don't actually have to start tapping into their retirement funds, as we might have anticipated, because they're now earning enough on their cash balances to finance um, many aspects that they would have previously accomplished by trying to sell stocks, you, you create this really weird world in which stock markets, instead of pricing on a forward basis and incorporating information, are dominated by these flow characteristics of money going into retirement accounts or not coming out of retirement accounts. And that can in turn drive exactly this sort of price behavior that we've seen. The problem is, is that very few people, you know, and candidly myself included, you know, struggle to fully believe this process, it, et cetera. We're used to thinking about stock markets as being the sum of collective intelligence. They're telling us something. 
We often talk about the terms of what's priced into the market, right? And many people sit there looking at the markets in disbelief saying, you know, it seems like everything is fine now, right? The markets are pricing in a, a soft landing or a no landing or a recovery. Um, and when you have this world of passive dominated vehicles, there is not actually information about the future prospects. In many ways, actually, there can be negative information, meaning you're firing the people who actually are trying to be thoughtful about portfolio construction and replacing them with people who have no interest in trying to do anything other than follow the market. And so you just create these very strange conditions under which policymakers and commentators can be very confused by what we're seeing, where empirically things like inflation are slowing, nominal wages are declining or disinflating. You know, and yet all the narratives are out there saying, no, oh, you know, this is a uh, this is a no landing and recovery sort of scenario. So it's a good, it, you know, I, I've said it a couple of times, but it's it's a very confusing time. It feels to me like a wily e. coyote moment where we're sus in suspended animation, you know, off the cliff, um, and eventually we'll start to fall. It's just a matter of time about when. And then I guess, as you said, it's sort of like the supply to demand issue going up. Is that going to be the same going down? So it's almost like it's, you know, we have these massive increases in price in, in short periods of time. And then potentially if it goes down, it's going to be the same phenomenon. Well, you know, again, we don't know the answer to this, of course, right? Um, what, what the... Um, models I'm referring to would suggest is, is that we are far more prone to melt up and melt down type behavior, right? Um, in mathematical terms, the distribution of outcomes in price markets become increasingly negatively skewed when a market becomes increasingly inelastic, meaning um, the supply and demand don't change as much based on uh, uh, the price has to change more because supply and demand don't adjust to changes in price, right? Um, that the term inelastic or elastic is is comes from um, economic modeling where an inelastic good is something where the demand doesn't change much in response to the change in price. The supply doesn't change much in response to the change in price. When you start thinking about modeling a supply and demand framework for the stock market, introducing players like passive vehicles that simply buy in proportion to the market cap in response to either inflows or outflows, where does price have any, or prospects of forward return, where does that have any influence on their supply and demand characteristics? So that's the underlying dynamic, unfortunately, that then leads to this type of you know more extreme behavior We've seen so few examples of where that flow has turned negative that we actually really can't do anything other than offer a hypothesis around how it behaves. But if I look back on the very few periods where we actually have seen those flows turn negative, they include things like the market crashes in, in uh, September of 2015. Um, they include things like the uh, COVID-related crashes, you know, where I've gone on record as saying the most frightening comment I heard coming out of COVID was from Vanguard that less than 1% of their clients tried to sell, right? And my reaction was like, oh my God, what if it had been two, right? Um, you know, we saw a, a near record decline in very short time period. The fact that they perceived themselves as not an adverse contributor to that should shock the hell out of everybody and kind of open their eyes about what could potentially happen as these vehicles become larger and larger. Yeah, definitely scary to think. So, you know, you mentioned that you, you think that we're sort of in this moment of, you know, the coyote sort of hovering in midair over the, uh, over the cliff, just, just uh, waiting to fall. So what, what do you think the catalyst would be? Or are there any thoughts of what that catalyst could be that could potentially, I guess, push the economy into a set of, you know, into a recession and then, uh, the markets to decrease as well? Would it be a credit event? Would it, would it have impacts on, you know, be these businesses who employ 30% of US, uh, you know, population? What, what would it be, do you think? So my bias is, is that it's going to be a credit event that it'll be tied to, you know, some form of corporate bankruptcies or a surprising inability to refinance. I can point to everything ranging from, you know, levered giants like AT&T um, or Verizon, which have extraordinary pension obligations, 
tied to their employees have taken on significant quantities of what was um, very highly rated debt is an increasingly becoming lower rated debt in response to share losses, um, you know, cellular providers like Verizon, again, that are very heavily levered are raising prices in response to losing market share, right? And that's because they're hoping effectively that their clients don't notice these price increases or aren't paying attention. But this is occurring at the exact same time that new competition is emerging and pushing very hard against those sorts of price increases. Um, it's likely to accelerate share loss. And so they're hollowing out their business because they can't take the profit hit given their debt requirements. And those sorts of things, you know, work and work and work until they don't. Um, and so if that wall gets hit in any way, shape or form in a surprising manner for a larger company, we could see you know that function as a catalyst not dissimilar to the enron uh, debacle in 2001 2002 the worldcom debacles in 2002 um, those types of scandals can you know and types of surprises can i think create very adverse conditions but i you can't pick on any of those right i mean because the lower end of the consumer is also out of cash and so they could hit a wall they could choose to start doubling up on properties um new york city has an interesting dynamic i just want to you know highlight some some ways that things can play out right currently new york city is in the headlines because of a shortage of rental apartments well one of the dynamics when i used to live in new york city was that there was a premium for three bedroom units over one bedroom and two bedroom units because families were increasingly staying in new york they were consolidating units that was reducing supply and leading to tightness of the market well now new york city is a hellscape from a raising a family standpoint nobody wants to live there many people are trapped there those three bedroom units are actually now starting to trade at a discount to one and two bedroom units where people are renting, you know, having a pied a terre, younger people are crowding into the city for job opportunities. It's one of the few places left where they can actually have a social engagement around their employment. People underappreciate how important that is for younger people to be in an office, to actually have exposure to mentors, to have exposure to peers in a physical interaction. And so people are crowding into places like New York. Well, if you start converting those three bedroom and four bedroom units that you had combined to create, you know, um, combined units, you're suddenly increasing the supply of units dramatically and the economics are beginning to move in that direction. So, you know, the, like little things like that, that seem like they really are unsolvable problems. If you create the economic conditions that offer solutions, they'll be taken, right? And so it's just a matter of time before we begin to work around the restrictions and challenges that we have and resolve some of these things. And ultimately that's a benefit. But the, the weird part, Anthony, and this is I think the part that people tend to forget is when you have a central bank like the Federal Reserve who is hell bent on a particular interpretation of facts, they're actually creating disincentives to those creative solutions emerging in the private sector. And so that it, like that's the thing that worries me most same thing by the way with passive investing right i mean passive investing has no way of saying hey this is a new innovative company the only way we discover a new innovative company is somebody actually going out and doing the work and saying hey i'm willing to put capital at risk in this company more than other people are willing to do that transaction raises the price of that asset in turn leading it to become a larger portion of an index but we take the money away from the smart, young, capable asset managers who might be making those types of choices or the entrepreneurs who would be responding to those signals, we actually end up harming ourselves long term. Yeah, it's very much short term th thinking. And I guess if we, if we go internationally from a maybe not as much developed market, but emerging markets, we've seen that some have uh, performed quite well, Latin America, um, India's performed quite well until recently, but then I guess China as well seems to be a bit of a, uh, to have economic issues. It hasn't really, the, the reopening hasn't hit uh, consumption and exports are down uh, and then there's sort of more concern about that. So do you, do you think it's going to be a similar trend in these international markets or do you think it's, or and in international countries, or do you think it's just going to be a uh, region by region phenomenon? The classic, the, you know, the classic expression is when the U.S. Uh, sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold, right? And I think we're definitely seeing that, right? We're seeing slowing rates of consumption growth. Quantity growth is actually turning negative. 
I mentioned the housing market, for example, um, you know, the shortage of everything housing related is now turning into surplus. Uh, I would encourage, uh, you know, UK listeners to fire up their internet browser and go to US versions of Walmart and Best Buy, et cetera, and look at what's happened to electronics prices, et cetera. They're just collapsing. I mean, it's just unbelievable how much they've fallen. Well, these are all the things that we desperately wanted going into or, or in the early stages of the pandemic, right? If I'm going to be trapped at home, my 55-inch TV no longer does me any good. I need an 85-inch TV and I'm willing to pay a premium to get it because I'm not spending my money on going to restaurants or I'm not spending my money on gas or I'm not spending my money on you know commuting into the city and paying tolls, et cetera. Now those price signals that flowed through created excess supply on a structural basis in particular brought forward many of the Chinese brands. And so we're seeing pressure that's causing those prices to collapse. Um, you, you know, that that sort of stuff I think is absolutely playing through in the United States. And when that happens, things shut off or increasingly start shutting off in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is also challenged because unlike the United States, which operates with an extraordinary amount of aggregate surplus, right? We have relatively cheap food here. We have relatively cheap housing um, that leads to the U S being able to sustain itself. We have much more stable energy prices than the UK in particular has, for example, or various other areas around the world. That leads to us being less elastic in our response for the demand for those things, whereas the rest of the world is suddenly being forced to face very real pressures of, you know, do I feed my family or do I feed, do I heat my home, right? Um, and making a choice between those two seems unfathomable to many people in the developed world. Um, those at the lower end of the spectrum are starting to experience some of that stress in places like Eastern Europe, France, in in the Van Lu, for example. Um, some areas in the UK are, are under that type of pressure. Um, and if Americans were dealing with that, I think we'd have a very different outcome, uh, at least at this point. But when you just think about that manifesting itself then around the world, you know, it's very negative for China, which has a very structural problem in that their population and labor force are both now contracting. Most people think about that as a supply dynamic but they forget that when you actually shrink populations or labor forces, what you're actually doing is shrinking consumption. And so in order to um, maintain its current levels of production, that means China has to find sources of demand in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is suddenly waking up and saying, hey, wait a second, we don't want all your supply because it means that we're structurally one at risk because your behavior has proven to be somewhat um, uh, you know, hostile to Western interests, I would argue, particularly the interests of the United States, obviously, um, but also because it means that we impair the employment prospects for many people in the United States, for example, or in Europe, right? The European auto manufacturers are under tremendous pressure from the emerging Chinese auto manufacturers. You know, we forget that Europe led the charge against Japan auto manufacturers in the 1980s and 1990s, instituting some of the most restrictive policies available. The U.S. also followed that. Right. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see. Does the interest in, you know, green outcomes outweigh the uh, realities of economic impact? And again, China needs that external demand because they can't generate it internally. Yeah, and if you link it to that green uh, consumption, it's really interesting. I was reading something uh, recently where it said Europe Europeans are probably more likely to want to sacrifice uh, potentially for, for that green solution, whereas Americans is more about innovate, 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 and try and keep the current uh, you know uh, you know lifestyle while innovating and almost trying to yeah get out of uh, you know have the same big trucks but with. Uh, green technology and then China wants to control the whole supply chain. So it'll be interesting to see how, how that dynamic works moving forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, I think uh, first Europe, I think tends to do a better job of collectivist type behaviors within a, a local region. Their populations are far less diverse than in the United States. And so that creates its own interesting tension. Um, in the United States in terms of our inability to address these things. But remember the old adage, right? Like, 
like everything you're saying seems unreasonable, right? Of course, we know we have climate change and therefore we have to modify our behaviors to, ad to adapt for that. But the important thing is, is that all progress depends upon the unreasonable man, right? Somebody who's willing to say, you know, well, it's fine. All right, I'll take less. That's not an entrepreneur. That's not somebody who creates something new and innovative. That's, you know, somebody who's falling asleep on the job. Yeah, I agree. That's an interesting way to look at it. So uh, in terms of what, you, what you've mentioned there, I guess, uh, you know, in the next six months, you think, or well, there was no time frame, but in the future, you think there could be this credit event, which does permeate throughout throughout the economy. So then how are you looking to allocate uh, you, yourself for that and maybe prevent, uh, yeah, how, how are you looking to allocate yourself for that? Well, I, you know, I continue to think, think that we are very close to that type of event, right? We're starting to see the stress, um, what's called the maturity wall of high yield paper um, and even more so the maturity wall of commercial real estate and shorter term um, uh, equipment financing, et cetera. Those are all hitting now, basically, right? In the next you know, 18 months, you're going to see tremendous pressure that emerges from companies that have debt that they took on in 2020 and 2021 you know, term debt that has a four or five year term associated with it, the typical uh, number is actually about six years. So as you approach the maturity wall of that paper, about a year before you actually hit that paper expiring, you have to like, you have to have financing lined up in place so that you can repay that maturing paper, right? Uh, that maturing debt. We're not seeing any signs of that. Right. We're not seeing the precursor behavior. We're not seeing the offerings of companies that are opportunistically trying to say, okay, credit spreads are tight. We're going to take advantage of it. And credit spreads are relatively tight, right? Just like implied volatility in equity indices is relatively low. Credit spreads for investment grade for, <clears throat> excuse me, for high yield are relatively tight, certainly versus the levels that we're actually seeing of actual distress, bankruptcies, et cetera. Um, again, that, this is one of these wall-like behaviors, right? Where it's like, you know, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything, everything's fine. And then you suddenly be like, wait, if we don't refinance this paper, we go out of business, right? Well, if you wake up and discover that if you can't refinance that paper, or if the price at which you have to refinance that paper permanently impairs your business anyway, then in many ways, the solution set is, okay, let's go bankrupt, try to get this over with, be the first in our industry to emerge with a much better cost structure. Well, that's deflationary pressure then on the remaining sources of the business, the remaining players in the industry who are suddenly confronted with a new low cost competitor that's competing for market share without the debt burdens associated with it, right? So you can see how all these things kind of play out and how they reintroduce themselves. Um, and that that's kind of like right out there, right? We're, you know, We've seen the, sh the those who have shorter term liabilities already get hit. And remember, that's really what the banking system is, right? The banking system, Silicon Valley Bank would be the extreme version of it. Their liabilities are deposits. They have to repay those the minute somebody shows up and says, hey, give me my money, right? Well, a lot of people showed up and said, hey, give me my money very rapidly. That led them to be forced to recognize losses that they otherwise would didn't want to. Um now we're approaching the next step in that process, right? It's businesses that have um, high yield financing that need to refinance, but simply can't, right? Um, it is commercial real estate or construction that is facing variable rate loans that are resetting higher. And as they look to finance that next piece of it, they're forced to acknowledge, hey, we need to engage in a buy down, put a ton of additional cash in, you know what, forget it. We're just going to walk away and hand over the keys. We're seeing that all over the place. Um, so it just becomes a question of does the magnitude of that grow to the point that it begins to materially impact people's outlook? We're just not there yet. So, or at least people don't want to acknowledge that we are there yet. Yeah. So, so I guess from your perspective, you're looking at those companies, you mentioned one before, uh, Kavani, you're looking at those companies who are going to, that might be a different uh, thesis, but who are going to really struggle uh, with you know refinancing and with their business models as well as I'm assuming during that period um, you know 10 year tip uh, uh, some certain uh, you know government bonds would uh, perform as well yep yeah perfect Makes yeah, sense. I, I, th I think that's right so I mean that that is largely where I'm positioned is in shorter term bonds with some leverage associated with it um 
because the other challenge that I think we have is, is that there's just not a lot of, um, you, you know, what's called the term premium, or uh, a lot of times people will talk about the yield curve, and they're they're very closely related concepts. You know, the yield curve is so deeply inverted in the United States that it becomes very hard to imagine a very strong response coming from the 30-year bond, you know, before the Fed begins to actually acknowledge and cut rates even further, right? We're, we're, it's basically we're, with the yield curve inversion that we have right now, the bond market is so far ahead of the Fed in acknowledging these factors that I'm referring to that the key risk is, is that they're just slow to materialize, right? And so until we see some proof that this starts to play out, I have a hard time seeing a scenario in which there's a very robust response coming from, uh, you know, duration or longer term bonds. I, I, I much prefer capturing the higher yield and the potential for immediate Fed rate cuts um, at the front of the curve. Yeah, makes sense. So, Michael, thanks again for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I guess my last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? Um, I mean... The, the one message, I mean, if I can only give people one message, it's that, look, I think things are actually very, uh, are going to develop in a very unfortunate manner. I would encourage people to be thoughtful about constructing their lives in a way that um, reflects deteriorating conditions. Um, and at the same time, I am send people the message that like, look, you know, this too shall pass, right? We've made a lot of really bad choices. Um, but the underlying human capital, the capability of the population, et cetera, remains there as long as we behave in a coherent and rational fashion. And so, you know, protests in which you burn a whole bunch of stuff down doesn't actually solve things. But replacing elected officials with those who are dedicated to a growth agenda, who are focused on raising the value of human capital, improving the lives in particular for children, as compared to the voting population, which is increasingly skewed elderly. Those are all, you know, people you want to hunt down and find and promote as leaders in our society. Um, we have, you know, a limited period of time with this democracy experience experiment before we prove or disprove that it's that we're capable of making good choices on a long term basis. Right now, we've done a pretty bad job of picking leadership. So I, 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 I hope people do better going forward while protecting themselves uh, on an individual basis. Yeah, I agree. That's a great message. So thanks again for your time. If uh, anyone wanted to find out more about your work, would Twitter be the best place? Is there anywhere else? So the easiest place to find me is um, either through the Simplify website, which is www.simplify.us, or you can find me on Twitter. Um, at, confusingly, I am at Prof Plum 99, P-R-O-F-P-L-U-M 99 conversation we don't want to have right now about how that happened but um and my uh avatar is also confusing i never expected to be on social media but uh it is vicini from the princess bride you know the world's smartest man who dies because he's overly confident in his opinions and um that should be fairly self-obvious i speak in a way that betrays an extraordinarily amount of confidence in my forecast but i i have to be honest with people that like it's just my opinion right doesn't necessarily reflect simplify doesn't necessarily reflect what's going to happen in the future. And all I'm trying to do is make sure I don't keel over from iocane powder, powder in a goblet. So thank you very much for having me, Anthony. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I love that story. And then you have a sub stack as well. Sorry, I don't know if we mentioned that. Mm. I do have a sub stack in which you can hear my various rantings uh, or read my various <laughs> rantings. It's Michael W. Green um, is the sub stack. You can find it under my Twitter profile um, and uh, encourage anyone to, to take a look at it. Perfect. I'll pull out on this issue below, but thanks again for your time. Perfect. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.